Hello everyone, I'm glad to be with you again today as I bring to you the word of God that will bless your life, bless your marriage, bless your relationship. And I believe that as um, we share God's word together today, God has a word for you. I'd like to urge you to invite your friends, to your loved ones to come and share this good news together with you. God bless you. I'd like us to pray briefly. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful moment we have to share from the world. We ask you to bless us and speak through us and speak to us through your word. Thank you, Holy Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. I want to thank God again for this privilege I have to be with you again today as we hear from the Lord through His Word. I would like to be speaking to you on some wrong notions about marriage, wrong, some wrong notions about marriage. There have been a lot of concepts, notions, philosophies about marriage that are contrary to the Word of God, contrary to God's own laws, God's own principles. And so today, I would like to be addressing some of those wrong notions. This affects both singles and married. And so, number one, notion I would like to address is that God doesn't give wives to men. That the last time God gave a man a wife was the case of Adam. And that since then, God stopped giving out wives to men. I'm sure you must have heard that. That is a fallacy. That is wrong. It's unscriptural. And I'm going to show you from the Bible that that was not the last time God gave a wife to a man. The marriage between Adam and Eve was not just about Adam and Eve. But God used that marriage to set the principle for marriage that will guide every human being in this world who will ever get married. You will realize that in the ministry of Jesus, Jesus will always make reference to the beginning. Jesus will say, from the beginning, it was not so. Is what the theologians call the principle of first mention. The marriage of Adam and Eve was a marriage instituted by God to teach us different lessons, precepts, and principles about marriage that will guide us. And so it would be wrong for anyone to say that that was the last time God ever gave a wife to a man and I will show you one or two instances in the Bible the first instance I would like to show you in the Bible is from the book of Genesis chapter 24 verses 12 to 14 Genesis chapter 24 verses 12 to 14 that was the account of Abraham and his servant when Abraham sent his servant to go and get a wife for Isaac. Now let's see what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 24. I read from verse, from verse 12. Alright, from verse 12. The Bible says. Sorry. Genesis 24 from verse 12. And he said, O Lord God, talking about Abraham's servant, 
O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. He was praying because he was going to get a wife for Isaac. And so he had to pray and depend on the Lord. Verse 13. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. Now look at verse 14. It says, And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee that I may drink, and she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant, Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. It says, let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant. So, there is a woman that God has appointed for every man. God has a woman for every man. God has a man for every woman. So aside the marriage between Adam and Eve, in the marriage of Isaac and Rebekah, God had a hand in it. God led Abraham's servants to meet Rebekah because the man knew that he was at the risk he, there was the risk of choosing the wrong person. And so he needed God to guide his steps for the right person for Isaac. Hallelujah. That is a very good example. Now, not only that example, there is also another example in the Bible. And that is the example of Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, and Mary when they got married. You remember in Matthew chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, after Joseph realized that Mary, his, his wife, or his wife-to-be, was pregnant before marriage, she was pregnant. And being a just man, Joseph wanted to secretly put her away and terminate the marriage. But in a dream, the Lord appeared unto Joseph and told Joseph, Joseph, don't put away Mary. Marry her. She is your wife. And that was how Joseph accepted Mary and they got married. So I've given you two examples from the Bible to show you that God is still in the business of choosing a spouse or choosing spouses for men. So don't believe that wrong notion that God has stopped giving out wives to men or giving out uh, husbands um, to women. No, God is still... In the business and so some persons often quote the bible and you know proverbs chapter 18 verse 22 says whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtains favor of the lord that is a very popular scripture that you are the one to, you have to find yourself leave god out of this matter you have to find the wife yourself but I think we need to learn how to balance scriptures. We shouldn't just quote scriptures out of context. The same Bible says in Proverbs 31, verse 10, it says, 
who can find a virtuous woman? Who can find a virtuous woman? Proverbs 20 verse 6 says, A faithful man who can find. Proverbs 26, A faithful man who can find. So, who can find a virtuous woman? A faithful man who can find. You need the light of the Holy Spirit. You need the light of God to shine in your path, to guide you in your search or choice of a spouse. Without the light of God, you might make errors. It is true, you have to do the search, but you need God in that search. God will not come and impose a wife on you. No, you have your own role to play as a man. God will not come and impose a husband on you. No, you have a role to play as a woman. But the point I'm trying to make is that there is the right person and you need God to guide you in your search. You need the light of the Lord. The Bible says your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You need the light of God to beam on your pathway, to guide you in your search for a spouse. Hallelujah. So, I think um, we've been able to handle that. It's wrong. God is still in the business of giving our spouses to people. At least I am a living witness. God led me to my wife and after several years of marriage, we are still living together happily and joyfully. I listened to a very respected servant of God talk about this. And he said the same thing, the same wrong notion I, I, I'm addressing now. He said, God doesn't give out um, spouses again. That even for Adam, God did not give him. God did not say, this is your wife. That God merely brought Eve to Adam. And Adam said, now this is my wife. That didn't sound too good. It didn't, it didn't make it didn't sound too logical to me. Because if God brings only one person to me and present that person to me, what else is God saying? If God had brought two persons, two women to me and um, said nothing, then yes, I could then believe that maybe I have to exercise my discretion. I have to exercise my 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 choice. But in the case of Adam, God brought only one woman to Adam, one woman to him. And so what else would God be saying? Adam, this is the woman before you, she's your wife, marry her. And so God does not present two women <laughs> to you, bro. No, God, I had a story, a very funny story, several years ago of a brother praying to God, for the will of God in marriage. And the brother said God showed him five women that he should choose one. <laughs> no, God will never present two, three women for, before you and ask you to choose one. No, God is not the author of confusion. God has one woman for you. He has one man for you. Hallelujah. Now, the second wrong notion I would like to talk about is still not too different from the first, the last one I just talked about. And is that God's will for your life is only one person and there is no hope again for you if you miss that person. Now, don't get me wrong, it's a bit tricky but listen to what I have to say. They say that God's will for your life is only one and that if you miss that one person 
Ah, you've missed it. And you may have to remain unmarried for the rest of your life. That is not correct. I would like to put it this way. That God has one spouse for everyone per time of need. God has one spouse for everyone per time. Take for instance, I am not married and I'm praying to God for a wife. God has a wife, not wives. God has a wife for me at this time of need. And if God reveals that woman to me and I go to her, it is up to her to say yes or no. She is not bound to say yes because God has given her the right, to the, uh, the freedom of choice. She's a free moral agent. So she has the power to say, no, I will not marry him. And if she says, no, she will not marry me, should I remain unmarried? No. Per time of need, God has one spouse for everyone. God, in his power and wisdom, will bring somebody else to come my way. Now, what happens to people who get bereaved, who lose their spouses? Does that mean they will remain unmarried? No. If you lose your spouse, God will send someone else your way. God is, is too great to be limited by just one person for you. Praise the Lord. Now, if you look at the example of Judas Iscariot, this is not an example of marriage, but the principle there can guide us. Judas is carried out in Acts chapter 1 after his death. The Bible says the apostles had to appoint Matthias. They Matthias was chosen as a replacement for Judas is carried out. Judas was chosen. His name was written in the book of life. Even according to um, the book of Revelation, his name, the Bible talks about the city having 12 foundations. And on them we are written the names of the apostles. I believe the name of Judas was on one of those foundations. But when Judas backslid, God had to bring a replacement. The Bible says, let his bishop be, taken, be given to another. God can never be limited. So, it is not true that he's only one woman. And if that woman does not come, you are finished. Or it's only one man. And if that man does not come, you're finished. you're finished. No, that is not correct. So, God has one spouse for every man, every woman, per time of need. I think that, is, that explains it better. Praise the Lord. Now, the, the third fallacy or wrong notion about marriage I would like to talk about is that some people say that marriage is a game of luck. Marriage is a game of luck. Or marriage, a good marriage is a miracle. Those who want to spiritualize it to call it a miracle. No. Marriage is not a game of luck. Some say, ha, if you're lucky, it's good for you. If you're not lucky, bad for you. Some say, oh, I'm among the unlucky ones. I've done everything possible. And yet I found myself in this mess. Marriage is not a game of luck, beloved brother, beloved sister. A good marriage is the product of the application of the right principles. Go and investigate and check through all the successful marriages. 
you will discover that they are all doing similar things. Just go and find out. The husband and the wife are doing similar things. Then on the other hand, go and investigate and find out why marriages fail. Go and investigate failed marriages or failing marriages. You will also discover that they are all doing similar things. So what are those things they do? They are applying the wrong principles. When you apply the right principles, you will get the right results. But when you apply the wrong principles, you will certainly get the wrong results. So my friends, marriage is not a game of luck. To the glory of God, I believe that I'm one of the beneficiaries of God's mercy in the area of marriage. I'm enjoying my marriage with my spouse. But my marriage was not made in heaven, so to say. At the initial period of my marriage, it was tough. It was challenging. I literally felt that hell was raging and coming against me and my wife. But we believed God and we prayed together. Not just praying together, learning, reading, understanding one another, applying the principles of the Word of God. And friends, that same marriage that looked as if it was hell raging, that same marriage is like heaven on earth, I'm telling you. So, beloved, apply the right principles and certainly you will get the right results. Praise the Lord. Now, the, the last principle I would like to, or the last wrong notion, I would like to address today is that the notion that love diminishes after wedding. Love starts to diminish after wedding. You know, when I was single, I thought about this. I thought about this. How can, how can you be living with your spouse? Every day, the same person, day after day, week after week, year after year, you don't get bored. How can? Like somebody rightly said, how can you be eating okra soup? <laughs> Morning okra soup, afternoon okra soup, evening okra soup, day one, day two, week one, week two, week three, month one, month two, year one, year two, for years, the same okra soup, the same ebusi soup, and you don't get bored eating okra soup. <laughs> you know that actually, if it is okra soup you are eating, you get tired. You want to change to something else. And they bring the same analogy and say, in marriage, you will get bored. Get bored? No. No. I'm not saying that the feelings of boredom may not come. Or will not come. They may come. Those feelings may come because the feelings of man, the, the feeling, the senses of man are so fickle. So unstable. So you don't walk by your senses. You don't live by your feelings. Yes, in marriage, sometimes you may feel bored. But don't allow the deceptive dispositions of your feelings, of your emotions, to mislead you. Now, 
Love is not about feelings. I repeat, love is not about feelings. Even though when you love, there will be some elements of feelings, emotions. But love is well beyond and deeper and higher than those feelings or emotions. If it is true love, true love never diminishes. As a matter of fact, I am not telling you theory. I have been married about eight years of marriage now, and I still love my wife like I loved her. In fact, I still love her like I loved her before. Our love is as sweet as it was then. In fact, it gets better. It gets better. In every dimension. So it is not right to say that love diminishes after wedding. Now let me say this that might surprise you. I discover that actually love, if it is love, true love, love neither diminishes nor grows. No. That may surprise you. Love neither diminishes nor grows. Love does not diminish. Love does not grow. Yes, it is true. The Bible says God is love. And if God is love, God does not diminish. God does not grow. But what happens in our relationship with the Lord? It is our knowledge and understanding of the Lord. When you discover him more, it will look as if he has grown in you. When you know him more, it will look as though he has increased in you. He, he was never diminished. Or he has never diminished or grown. Rather, it is your knowledge and understanding of the Lord that either grows or diminishes. The same thing applies to love. It is our understanding of love that makes it look as though our love is increasing or diminishing. Let me read a scripture to you in the book of Ephesians chapter 3 verse 19. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 19, Paul the Apostle was writing to the church at Ephesus. And this was his prayer for, let me say, and to know the love of Christ, to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. So beloved, when what you need to know, or what you need is to increase in your knowledge of love. When your knowledge about love increases, you will demonstrate love more. When your knowledge about love diminishes, your demonstration of love will be deficient. So even though you might be married for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, your love for your spouse should never diminish. The feelings might diminish, but love never diminishes. True love does not diminish. I believe you have learned some lessons today. I will come again to you next time, and when I come, I will see continue in this um, teaching on wrong notions about marriage. And before I leave you, I would like to pray with you very briefly. Lord, we thank you for this privilege we have today to talk about marriage. I ask, Lord, that these new revelations, knowledge you've given to us, may it bring about the transformation of our lives, marriages, and relationships. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
God bless you. I'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.